And do you Great want my video? Boys. We're here to learn about nuclear chemistry because I don't want what happened to my good friend, Bruce Banner, to happen to any of you. Um, and I looked it up. What happened to me was uh, something like soldier serum. And I have to tell you, one year, somebody did their molecule on what they injected me in. Um, and so I've been a little disappointed that nobody is doing that. I also had somebody one year do unobtainium. So we're doing nuclear chemistry. You know, this is a brand new pen and it's not gonna be dark enough. Let's try another one. I think they're all a bad batch. And do red, white, and blue. So nuclear chemistry is the study of the nucleus. So what do you remember about the nucleus? It has protons and neutrons and yeah it's a study there is a there is an ideal ratio of protons and neutrons and when you have the wrong ratio protons and neutrons you get an unstable nucleus and it breaks apart and that's what nuclear chemistry is is the study of unstable nuclei um, so protons and neutrons are called nucleons these are terms from way back in 221 in our introductory chemistry just to make sure so a nucleon is the particles in our nucleus so protons and neutrons um, and then the other word that we're going to see a lot tonight is the word isotopes. So you may remember that word. Iso means same. So these guys have, are the same elements. But what would be different is they have a different mass. So. Do you remember your Chem 221? Same element means same. Remember which one of these is the same? And hopefully they're all saying protons. So any element that has five protons in your periodic table would be boron. Um, if we were talking about uranium, uranium is number 92. So if you remember, we put the atomic number is always the lower number. Uh, and then the top number is the mass number. The mass number is the proton plus the neutrons. It is always a whole number, and I will have to give it to you. So let's say uranium-238. There's several different isotopes of uranium. There's uranium-235. There is uranium-234. There's a whole bunch of them. Every element has multiple isotopes. At least one of the isotopes is unstable. Um, uranium, all of them are unstable. But what makes them, we always call them uranium, is they all have 92 protons. So, You'll need your periodic table a lot with this because we're going to be going back um, to the protons. And if you subtract the protons, the atomic number from the mass number, you of course would get the neutrons. Uh, and so each of these has a different mass because they have a different number of neutrons. So hopefully that's bringing a bell. Uh, the history is really, really fascinating. Usually I spend like a week and a half on this. But um, I will leave it for you guys. Some of you will get, oh, nobody picked um, any of these for their compounds. But last term, like a couple of you did, uh, and you talked about some of these. Um, the brief bit of history I will tell you is about 
this little chart we're going to do now, which is ionizing radiation. Uh, and that was Ernest Rutherford actually got his Nobel Prize for discovering the alpha and beta particles. And when these guys break apart, they release ionizing radiation. So what's really exciting, you guys can now hear the planes going over. So we have airplanes again. Airplanes are flying. That tells us we're back to like everything's getting back in the swing of stuff. So the first like six lectures that I was doing, there were no airplanes, seven lectures. Um, so when it breaks apart, you always release ionizing radiation. The term radiation was coined by Marie Curie. Um, because she knew something was unstable and uh, about them. All right. And this summer, again, you guys pick a famous chemist. So you can pick early. You can you send me an email, and I'll tell you, Marie Curie is always the first one taken. Um, but there's so many. There's so many famous ones. So ionizing radiation is something that can cause damage. because it can knock electrons out of orbitals. We talked, I talked earlier this term, a lot about free radicals. And a reminder, uh, some of you had told me you were doing a healthy change for the month, for the term, or you're doing meditation, you were continuing. Um, and so don't forget, I'll send an email out, but those would be due, again, like your papers by the 12th of this month. Um, so they're gonna knock electrons out. Free radicals are something that are missing an electron, so they steal electrons. So, um, the ionizing radiation is something that has a lot of potential. And alpha, beta, and gamma were the three classic ones, and we're gonna go through them. The symbols are alpha, beta, and gamma. So gamma is like the fish that died. Um, the fish here, this is alpha, this is beta. And then gammas, yeah, they're all bad. They're all ionizing radiation. They're all gonna cause damage. So that's the basic symbol. The full symbol, Captain America is a little big on me. Um, for alpha is a four and a two. So like what I just talked about, the top number is the mass number. Alpha is huge. This is, this is like the Tyrannosaurus Rex of ionizing radiation. This thing is massive, um, and that's why it causes damage. It's actually really slow and clunky because it's so big, uh, and, but it's the size of it. So it has a mass of four, and this four is AMUs, which are atomic mass units. So really it's like 10 to the negative 24 grams. It's really small, but on the atomic scale, this is massive. And the two means it has a plus two charge, which is also huge. Um, and so that causes the issues. And so how something can have a plus two and have a mass of four is it's made up of two protons plus two neutrons, all in a package together. So that would be an alpha particle, is two protons plus new, two neutrons um, so when it releases it, it releases that all together as this one particle. Um, it's a fast weight loss for an unstable nucleus. It just gets rid of four AMUs really fast. And we're gonna do the equations in a minute. All right, and another way it says alternate symbol is what element is number two is helium. So some books will symbolize it with a helium symbol. I don't like that symbol because it's not the same as helium. Because what helium has that alpha does not, helium has electrons. So it is the same as the helium nucleus. If I can spill. All right. 
We're all good, boys and girls? That's what an alpha particle is. This guy is extremely damaging, so it has the highest damage potential. And that is because in the nuclear world, size matters, and this thing is massive. So if a T-Rex came running in here, I, I would get my shield and protect all of you, but I think my shield was destroyed in one of the movies that I didn't see, so. And my shield is made out of something really special. So if, if you see this and you don't like your compound, um, again, somebody did their paper a couple of years ago on it and it was so funny. Um, all right, beta. Beta gets the symbol of zero and negative one. Um, so how can something have no mass? Well, it's not that it has no mass, it's just that it's such a small mass that it's not recorded. Its mass is really 1 18 20ths of an AMU, and its charge is a negative one. So basically, it is an electron. So that's my symbol for electron. It's always how Captain America, back in the days, wrote an electron. It is not an ordinary electron because most electrons are there in the orbitals, right? This is an electron that came from the nucleus. And so how this happens is a neutron breaks apart. So the neutron breaks apart. And the neutron is made up of a proton so that's a symbol for a proton, mass of one, atomic number of one. This is a symbol for a neutron, mass of one, atomic number of zero. And by the way, this is kind of like a little quote unquote cheat thing that people will do. The top number is your mass, which is your proton plus neutrons. And the lower number is your protons, or some people will say the charge. So that's why a two means you have two protons or a plus two and the minus one means, um, but what happens is proton, I did two of right, and an electron. The proton stays in the nucleus. And the electron is released from the nucleus. So the difference between that electron and normal electrons is it came from the nucleus. It is being ejected by the nucleus. And so it has potential. It's like going crazy. And if it comes, so it'd be like, we'll take Aaron. Um, if we took Aaron and we wound him up and we gave him like 20 energy drinks, and 50 snicker bars, and we just jacked him up on sugar, and then we let him go loose, Aaron's gonna be, if I did this to any of you, you would be all over the place. And so even though Aaron is similar size to all of us, unless you're Captain America, you're gonna get knocked over by Aaron. Um, and so Aaron's like a beta particle. He's the same as all the rest of you, but because he has so much crazy energy, he's gonna knock out everything in the path, except Captain America. All right, so that's a beta particle. It's, it's really this, an electron that came from the nucleus, so it's a jacked up electron. Oh, and we can throw in lots of caffeine in there too for Aaron and anybody else. All right, gamma is what happened to my dear friend, uh, Bruce Banner. He got exposed to gamma particles because he thought he could become like me. It wasn't gonna happen because they destroyed that machine or something. And so then Bruce Banner was playing with gamma rays and we all know what happened to him. Gamma is truly rays. It is no mass, like no mom, no charge. It's nothing. So how can it cause damage? Uh, this is back again in 221. It is high frequency electromagnetic waves. So 
it is higher frequency than ultraviolet rays. And we know that if you get exposed to too much ultraviolet rays, we can have damage to our skin. Um, that's why people will wear covered up if they're out in really, really bright, sunny weather in the summer. Um, and like when you go to Asia, uh, those of you who are from there, everybody walks around with umbrellas usually in the summer, especially the women, to keep their skin looking very healthy and stuff. So this is really high frequency electromagnetic rays, uh, beyond x-rays, beyond ultraviolet rays. And so if something has a high enough frequency, it can knock electrons out. Because after all, electrons are, matter is just electromagnetic waves that have materialized as something. So really, this is what it's all about. Um, all right. So there is no alternative symbol for gamma. There, this, is, this is it. It's just high frequency electromagnetic waves and it's high enough frequency. And the reason we talk about it with this is it comes from unstable nuclei. And that's what my dear friend Bruce Banner is playing with and he became the Hulk. So you shouldn't play with gamma rays. So there was a question all the way to the right near columns that asked what blocks each one. Alpha is a Tyrannosaurus Rex. So if you have my, so my uh, shield, my shield will block anything. But alpha particles are actually blocked by your skin. You all have the potential to be like my shield. You can just say to that T-Rex, stop. And that T-Rex will just stop. And will be like, whoa, what happened here? Um, but your skin, a piece of paper will block alpha. It is too big. Uh, the problem with alpha this is kind of crazy, is alpha, once it gets in you, it can't get out of you either. And so um, radon number 86 RN is, gives off, is a gas. It's a noble gas, but it is radioactive. And because it's a gas, you breathe it in. And this is a whole issue with radon, is it then is in your lungs and gives off an alpha particle that's in your lungs. And so you have alpha particles that are now stuck inside you. So you have all these little T-Rexes running around. Um, something really interesting, they, there are radon caves in Idaho and people swear by them that they get rid of their arthritis. And my theory is when you go in those caves, you have no cell phone reception, there's no TV, and you just have to be quiet for two hours. And you all would feel better if you turned your cell phone off for two hours and didn't listen to the, all the news and all the craziness. Uh, beta is blocked by plastic, really thick plastic. And why that's important is you can see through plastic. Plastic is clear. So when me, Joyce, your teacher, uh, when I was in graduate school, we did a lot of work with beta particles and um, we'd always work around plexiglass that was a certain thickness. And then gamma, you would need something like lead, um, so PB or denser. So aluminum isn't going to work. My shield, absolutely, because it's so freaking dense. That's why it's so special. Uh, gold would work. So when you get to the moon, the astronauts had those gold shields because uh, cosmic rays are even higher frequencies. So they needed something even denser. So the atoms are packed so tightly that the gamma rays can't get through the lead. If you had something like aluminum, there's space. Um, and so that's why if you go to the dentist, they don't put an aluminum shield on you. They put a lead apron on you. All right. Then there's question below it, the box that says, which one has the greatest ionizing potential? Alpha. Everybody always says gamma. I think they're thinking of the Hulk, um, but it's alpha and it's because of the size. It has the greatest potential for damage. Gamma rays um, have the greatest degree of penetration. So the second question there would be gamma are the most penetrating. But easy in, easy out. So it goes right through. And the chance it's going to hit something is very narrow. Whereas alpha, if it gets in you. So I had a physics teacher, and he said, you have three cookies. 
one's an alpha cookie, one's a beta, and one's a gamma, and you have to eat one. It's a sadistic question, but if you had to eat one, you would not eat the alpha, because that would, that would hurt you really bad. Um, you would eat the gamma. You would actually say, this is a terrible question, and you shouldn't eat any of them. Um, so then the question is, should you be worried? We usually spend more time talking about this. Um, no, you should not be, fear Fear is a bigger problem because, you know, if we sit here and worry about everything, we actually can create uh, the adrenaline response. We're the only species that can mentally create the adrenaline fear response, which is part of what the problem is right now. Uh, the best defense is walking away, um, meaning the further you get from the source of radioactivity, it's an uh, inverse square law, which is pretty much every law in nature. Um, so if you walk two feet away, you're now at one quarter of the exposure. If you get three feet away, you're at one ninth exposure. So that's why when what happened in, um, well, like Chernobyl and then in Japan and stuff, and they didn't evacuate the people was really, incorrect because the people needed to get moved away. Um, Chernobyl is really fascinating because it's now a national park because there are rock formations, uh, there is plant life that doesn't exist anywhere else and never existed there before. But that was a nuclear reactor that melted down in the former Soviet Union um, before most of you were born. All right, there's a little cute cartoon there that shows you. So the alpha particle is the biggest one. The electron is just an electron. It's shown way too big there. And then the photon is the gamma ray. Um, and what we're going to do on the next page is we're going to write a bunch of symbols. So I want to go through some of these other symbols just to make sure as we go through them. Um, and the reason we do nuclear chemistry right after kinetics is because we talked about half-life. Um, so the proton and neutron I already talked about. So a neutron we show as a little n. The charge is zero, but it does have a mass of one. So the symbol is a one on top and a zero on the bottom. A proton, that is a small lowercase p and has a mass of one and a charge of one. So it's a one, one. This is the same thing as hydrogen. So a hydrogen nuclei is the same as a proton. So if there's no um, electrons, it comes out the same. So you may see me or you might run into it. Like if you look at my homework key, sometimes I go back and forth between those. Uh, the other one is the positron. So positron is, you symbolize it like a beta particle. Its mass is the same as a beta particle, so it does have a mass, it's just really small. Um, so where the proton and neutron, well, the alpha particle here, which was four of those, was a Tyrannosaurus rex. This guy's like a little mouse compared to the Tyrannosaurus rex. So he's just gonna run around. Um, but it does have a positive charge. So it is equal mass to a beta particle, but the opposite charge. So it's a positive charge instead of a negative. Um, so it is usually symbolized like this. This is how I usually symbolize it. You do see it in some places where they show it as a positive electron. So instead of a negative electron. So my understanding is that is considered the antimatter of a beta particle or an electron. So equal the same mass, but the opposite charge. Um, that's about all I know. And then the other picture at the bottom of the page is the radium girls, which is like over 100 years ago, 150 years ago, they realized certain things would glow. And so these girls, this would be like 100 years ago, they, they would paint watches with radium. Um, and so they'd have to lick the brush to get the, the paintbrush really fine tips so they could paint the watch 
Uh, and that's the first glow in the dark watches were actually radium. And then a high percentage of these girls got throat cancer and tongue cancers and mouth cancers. And it was before we had the idea that this stuff caused cancer. Um, Marie Curie, if you see pictures of her in her early years, she looks much healthier than she does in her later years. She had, she had cancer all over her body. Um, her husband died from cancer, a uh, brain tumor. He died because he stepped in front of a carriage, a horse-drawn carriage. Um, but most people believe he knew he was very sick. Um, and so, all right, are there questions? I just erased everything, but. That's my dog. My dog has a question, apparently. All right, I'm going to move on to page 42, which is nuclear equations. And uranium-234, I will tell you if it goes through alpha or beta decay. So it tells you it goes through alpha decay. So how we write a nuclear equation, you have the, the piece you want. We do want to show the top and the bottom yeah. number. So uranium, there's two ways to show a symbol. This is how we're going to show it. But it is read always as the element and then the mass number, even though we write it like this in our balanced equations. These are not chemical equations. This is transmutation. This is what John Dalton said was impossible. Um, this is what the alchemists were trying to do. The particle is on the product side. So this is decay. The nucleus is breaking apart. Decomposition is, an, is a chemical reaction of a compound that is unstable. Decay is an unstable nucleus. So to balance the equation, the top numbers just have to be equal. So this is going to be, wow, Captain America is having trouble with math. This would be 230 plus 4 gives us the 234, and then this would be 90, because 90 plus 2 gives us 92. So top numbers just have to be the same on two sides of the arrows. And then you look at your handy-dandy periodic table, and that is TH, thorium. Simple enough. Um, that's why I said your last homework set and worksheet, uh, this is really the bulk of it, or half of it. All right, and then uranium-235, it tells you goes through beta decay. So we can make predictions about the decay, but everything has a unique way that it's, every isotope is either alpha or beta. Um, and then we'll also run into positron at some point here. So just go with whatever I give you. There is no change in the mass. The only thing that will change our mass is the alpha particles. But my new atomic number actually went up. So negative 1 plus 93 will get us back to 92. And that is because if you look back, beta decay was a neutron turning into a proton. And that so the total mass did not change, but we now created uh, another proton. And so the next planet after Uranus is Neptunium, and that is number 93. So again, the planets are in the order on your periodic table. So Uranium, Plut Neptunium, and Plutonium um, were named in the order of the planets. I believe Uranium was actually, the element was found about the same time the planet was found. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to go, we're going to walk through these. So iodine-131, again, that dash means your mass number. Periodic table, iodine is number 53. And the alpha and beta particle are always on the product side. And I told you beta decay. So go ahead and fill in your blank. I'm going to write my next one. All right, beta decay. 
So boys and girls, those of you watching at home, you should pause and try these and then go back and see if you got them. Um, all right, so it's 131 and my, my atomic number actually moves up one. So it becomes number 54 and number 54 is xenon. So this is decay again, and this is actually called natural decay. So every isotope has its natural way that it decays. So polonium, which was found by my dear friend Marie Curie. So if you remember, I was around back then. Uh, so polonium is number 84. And alpha decay is massive weight loss. So my issue is I was trying to gain weight. We are going to now be at a mass of 206, because 206 plus 4 gets us back there. And our new atomic number is 82. And 82 should be our good friend PB. I remember. Lynn. All right. Is there questions? Calcium 41. calcium 41. Oh, so this is a different one. So they found then that you could capture an electron. So it's like capture the flag. When you capture something, it's going to be on that side. So capturing on the reactant side. So it captures it. Our mass total is still 41. And our new atomic number because it's now 20 minus one on that side would be number 19, which is special K. All right, and then sodium 22 uh, goes through positron. So positron is a beta particle that has a positive charge. It is emission. They do not call it decay. I honestly have no idea why it's called emission. They only gave decay names to alpha and beta, but it is a form of decay. Um, alpha, beta, gamma, and positron is another type. The mass, again, does not change. Only alpha decay changes the mass. Uh, and our atomic number would be 10 because we have positive one and 10. And element number 10 should be neon. So. That's the idea of these. Is there questions? So for the next three, I'm gonna have you guys try it. What you wanna do, as I'm writing them out on the board, you wanna fill in your lower numbers and then you wanna just fill in the blank. I'm assuming you can read today that my pen is darker than last week. All right. So oxygen is number element number eight. Nitrogen is element number seven. So there are atomic numbers we put there. And again, the arrow is like an equal sign. So our missing number on top is a one. Our missing number down below is a one. This is a proton or hydrogen. Uh, and again, you can symbolize it either way. So a little p or hydrogen. They mean the same thing. All right. This is seven, this is six. This is not gonna be hydrogen because the mass did not change. The lower number is now going to be a plus one. So this is a positron. So this one up here was a proton. And this one is a positron. All right, and then strontium number 38. Yes. And deuterium is right next door at 39. So this is going to be beta decay. In beta decay, it always moves one up on the periodic table. No change in the mass. The atomic number changed 
um, up by one. So this is a beta decay. And then we got one more on this page. And you gotta be careful how this one's worded. It tells you the arsenic 77 is formed. So that means it is the product. It is beta decay. So we put the beta particle over there and we have to figure out what we started with. So they always call this side the parent. It was originally called the mother. They gave them all feminine qualities because they were unstable and the daughter would be the arsenic. Um, so 77 and 32. And then you look on your table, number 32 is germanium. All right, the picture, um, most of them, not all of them, but especially the larger ones like the uraniums, when they go through a decay, what they make is actually also unstable. And so then that will go through a decay. And so the picture at the bottom right-hand corner is showing you that like uranium decays um, I think it was uranium-238, and so it just keeps all these things decay until they finally reach something that's stable, and then the whole thing stops. Um, so questions before I move on to the next page. Oh, we're doing good. All right. The squid gets to erase everything again. So this is natural decay. And we can make predictions of how they will decay, but they actually have to do an experiment in a lab, like where they figured out how to make me. And I'm gonna show you though how to make a prediction because you get to do this in your homework. Um, so predicting. There is, on the periodic table, if we look at, this is our neutrons, this is our protons, this would be a ratio, sorry, of one to one. If you look like carbon 12, the atomic mass is closest to the most stable isotope. Um, but as you get further on the periodic table, it's not a perfect doubling. So like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, you perfect, you double it and you get the um, atomic mass. So Oxygen uh, 16 would be the most stable form. Nitrogen 14 would be a stable form, carbon 12. And so actually that's why it's showing you there's this band of stability. And that's where this is our stable. So you start needing more and more neutrons and that makes sense because protons are all positive and we know positives want to repel each other. They don't like to be together. So you start needing more and more neutrons to keep it stable. Um, and that's what I was saying at the very beginning, radioactive or nuclear chemistry is radioactivity. Ionizing, radioact ionizing radiation is radioactive. Um, you need, it's a ratio of neutrons to protons. And when you're not in this band of stability, so it's, When you're not in that band of stability, you're going to go through decay. Um, now, if you get just too big, which means over 82 protons, you're just too big, uh, like my good friend Bruce Banner. And he, that would be everything after lead. You would predict they would go through alpha decay because they need to lose weight. Their nuclei is just too big to be stable, um, but they don't all go through alpha. Some of them go through beta and then alpha, uh, or they might go through two betas and then an alpha. Um, if you are above the band of stability, it means you have too many neutrons. And we already saw beta decay. This is um, beta decay changes a neutron into a proton. 
And so if something's over here has too many neutrons and how you could tell on the periodic table would be like nitrogen 15. Nitrogen wants to be nitrogen 14. So 15 means it has one more neutron, but it went through beta decay. So we make a prediction, it's not always right. If you're below the band, uh, it means you have too many protons. And so we want somehow for a proton to change into a neutron. And when it does that, that would be positron. So something that has too many protons um, will often go through positron. Actually, going back to the one I just pointed out, this nitrogen has too many neutrons because the mass we would want for the nitrogen is 14 on the periodic table. So we would want to predict beta decay, but this actually went through positron. But if you look at what it made, it made carbon 15. That doesn't make any sense, right? Like that's not going to be stable either. So that's going to go through decay. Um, and this is just what happens to nitrogen. Uh, you will be told what type of decay. There are questions where it says to predict. And again, you're not going to be tested on this. It's, um, I had to make a decision two months ago, and I decided that we would do this after the midterm. All right. Um, yeah. So if you're above the band, you have too many neutrons. It goes through beta decay. If you're below the band, you have too many protons. So an example again. Um, if we look at strontium, yeah, all of those we would predict they would want to go through beta decay. If you had something like, let's say, like chlorine 32. So chlorine wants to be 35, is going to be its stable number. So this number is too small. So we'd want, it has too many protons. So we would predict this to go through positron. And again, the predictions are not always right. Um, it, it's like one question in your homework. All right. I'm going to erase unless there's a question. And artificial transmutation. Artificial means man made. We are no longer doing natural decay. And they put the word transmutation because that was the word the alchemist used. I had a really hard time because I have my alchemist outfit. Um, if I wanted to wear that one tonight. All right, but artificial transmutation is what we figured out in the past hundred years. Um, so this was uh, Seaborg, another really awesome famous chemist. Uh, if, if, they, if their name's on the periodic table, they're obviously up for doing your famous chemist for 223. Uh, and this was down in California, and they made um, most of these elements down here, the transuranium series. Uh, and then Glenn Seaborg was the, the first um, head of our atomic energy agency, or whatever it's called. Um, and now CERN, the Hadron Collider, is where they do a lot of this stuff. But um, this is different because you're going to have two, two nuclei that were stable, so nitrogen and helium. So nitrogen-14 stable, and helium-4 is stable. And what they do is they wind them up with a lot of, um, in the magnetic area, and then they collide them, and they make something new. And Whenever they make something new, they usually get a little piece that they have to, they don't care about. Um, but that's a lot of, there's, there's different ways that in the Lawrence, Lawrencean, who's on the periodic table. So Lawrence made the first collider. It was a small one. Um, all right. So we fill in the oxygen and then we just add up. So we need a total of 18 on top. So my missing number is one. Need a total of nine on the bottom. So my other missing number is one. So you can either write again H 
or you can write P for proton. So there's always an extra piece and you're gonna fill in the blank. So go ahead and try that. I'm gonna get out of my Captain America outfit because Captain America is not a 50 year old woman. So this outfit's rather warm. Um, little n means neutron so that's a neutron whenever we show particles we give them lowercase this is aluminum so we fill it in and we get sodium it's not a stable sodium because sodium likes to be 23 but it's still sodium we just go with what's there and we fill in the blank so 27 plus 1 is 28 so this is going to be a 4 and 13 plus 0 is 13, so it's going to be a 2. There we go. We have helium. Um, or, or, an alpha particle. You don't have to write it both ways. You can write it either way. All right. Probably some of you already filled in your blank and some of you are just waiting for me to do it. So fill in your numbers. Oxygen would be eight. This is a proton. So 16 plus one is 17. So this needs to be a four over here and nitrogen's number seven. So eight plus one is nine. This was 17. Um, I just do those, those numbers circled are just the two sides have to be equal. The top numbers are equal, the bottom numbers are equal. So very different from a chemical equation. In a chemical reaction, uh, we neither create nor destroy. Here, we're just balancing the nucleus, the protons and the neutrons. So again, this you can symbolize as a helium or an alpha particle, because it's not truly alpha decay. Um, it's two things colliding to form it. Um, so then number four is the interesting one. And it was about 100 years ago. They took a uranium. They took a whole bunch of different things. And so they took uranium and it absorbed the neutron. and just formed uranium-239. But then uranium-239 goes through two beta decays and um, no, I don't have that there, but since I'm going in this direction, so this goes through beta decay. I'm sorry, I'm assuming you can still see me, yes. So you get 239 and number 93, Neptunium. The beta particle goes off into the great blue yonder, causes havoc. The Neptunium decays by beta decay, forms number 94. That's how they made plutonium. Is Neutron absorbed, it became uranium-239, it went through two successive beta decay, and they had plutonium. This is what goes on at Hanford. All right, plutonium can do something, very few things can do this. Um, uranium-238 cannot, thank goodness, because we humans um, do some bizarre things. I'm gonna erase this. So what they found is uranium-2, some of the uranium, and it turned out it was uranium-235, it does not absorb the neutron. So uranium-235, plutonium-239, 
if you shoot a neutron at them, these guys will go through fission, which means you split the atom. For better or worse, that's what we figured out about 85 years ago. Um, and so what it was was, anyway, questions before we move on to the next page. Oh, so Otto Hahn and Liza Meitner. Um, Liza Meitner, this was in Germany right before the Nazi regime. And Liza Meitner was Jewish, so she had to leave. But before she left, they did all this work and they didn't know what was going on because they kept making smaller things. And they couldn't understand because they thought the neutron should be making something bigger and bigger. And they kept getting smaller pieces. And so the story goes, and this might just be a really awesome myth, but it doesn't matter. It's really awesome that um, Otto Hahn and her were walking and it was winter time, there was snow and his shoe was untied. So he stopped to tie his shoe and she was walking along and most boys can't handle somebody in front of them when they can make a snowball and throw it at her. So he threw a snowball at her because she got ahead of him. And of course, when a snowball hits your back, it splits. And so the story is that's when Liza Meitner said, oh my gosh, we've been splitting the atom. So who knows if that story's right? She then had to flee Germany, leave everything she had behind. Um, and story goes from there. She wasn't on the Nobel Prize. Her picture's on the next page, page 44. Uh, she is on the periodic table as opposed to the people on the Nobel Prize. So she is absolutely up for grabs in 223 to do a paper on. Uh, best epitome on her grave of anybody. Um, so you can look her up. Look up epitome, which is the writing on somebody's gravestone um, for people who won gravestones. But for Liza Meitner, it's, it's actually a beautiful one. But fission is we split it. So you take a neutron. It does not split on its own. You need the neutron. And very few things go through fission. The vast majority of atoms absorb the neutron and just become bigger. Thank goodness. Um, but uranium-235, plutonium-239, when they pick up the neutron, the atom splits. You cannot predict how it will split. There's something like, for uranium, there are 200 possible ways that it splits. So here we go. It goes through fission and we make barium-141 and krypton-92. And I need to erase. So we need to fill in the lower numbers. So barium 56. This is, I'm really want to be in a classroom where I have a big periodic table again. Um, Krypton 36. And it doesn't add up. 92 plus zero is 92. 56 plus 36 is 92. So it always splits into two pieces. It doesn't split perfectly in half. It always splits into two pieces that add up to 92. But where it does not add up is the top numbers. This is 236, 235 plus one. And if I add up these two, I get uh, 233. So I'm missing three pieces. But I can't add any protons because my protons added up. So only this can be is this is three neutrons. So three neutrons. And that's what fission does. 200 possible answers here. So you will always be told it's gonna split. It gives us two pieces and then however many neutrons to get to make the equation balance. This is called a chain reaction. You only need one neutron to get it going. One neutron, remember even if you have just like a milligram of uranium, 
there's Avogadro's number of, right? So like 10 to the 20th something of uranium atoms. One neutron splits one atom. You now have three neutrons. It goes back and splits three more atoms. Each of those makes two, three, or four. And it goes critical in less than the snap of your finger, um, which is unfortunate. Um, so that's the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan on Nagasaki and Hiroshima were, or Hiroshima were, um, one was a uranium bomb and one was plutonium. And so the neutron and the source are kept separate. Uh, and then when they drop it, it um, they come together and then they just keep forming more and more and more neutrons and it's uncontained. Um, I heard an interesting talk last week and the universe is expanding, expanding, expanding. They say a nuclear bomb actually contracts. And that was actually one of the terrible things that happened is it causes a contraction. Um, uranium is almost all uranium-238. And so there is a critical mass of uranium or percentage of uranium-235. So if you go out and find, uh, and it's in the, the Southwest, so Utah has high amount of uranium. If you go to the Grand Canyon, there's actually an old uranium mine that is closed off. Um, when we went there 20 some years ago, you could actually walk in it. Now it's got huge gates and everything around it, um, which anyway, um, most of it is uranium-238. And so that was with Tennessee Valley uh, and the whole thing with the centrifuges when we go to like other countries and we're looking to see what their nuclear program is like. We're looking to see if they can isolate the uranium-235. So one of the ways is you can do what's called e-fusion. This is extra information, but e-fusion is how fast you make these into gases and then you put it through a really small hole. And so this would be if we took like on who's the smallest one here versus Aaron. So they're both humans. There's not that big of a difference. It's not like a T-Rex versus a mouse, but on is smaller than Aaron. She's going to get through that little hole faster. And so eventually they can start getting a higher amount of uranium-235 in their sample. And you don't have to have a pure sample. It's only like around 5% uranium-235. And it's enough that it can contain the chain reaction. The problem with plutonium, we can make really pure plutonium-239. And that's what they do at Hanford. And the craziest part of the story is I had a student 15 years ago and his grandpa worked on the project at Hanford. And so for his project in 222, you want to guarantee A plus, your grandpa worked at Hanford and made plutonium. Um, he interviewed his grandfather. And so we all got to watch. And that one was obviously more than a five, 10 minute presentation. That was like a half hour presentation. I still remember it. Um, and I'm so horrified by what he told me, the waste they just were told, go and dump it in the ocean. The oceans are so big, they can hold all our nuclear waste. And they were just in regular barrels and stuff that was just dumped in our ocean. Um, anyway. Um, so the picture at the top is Otto Hahn and uh, Liza Meitner, and the second picture is Enrico Fermi, and so Fermi did the first contained chain reaction. So our nuclear power plants are fission. If you can absorb these neutrons, then it won't go critical and you won't have an explosion that is terrible. Um, and so that's what nuclear power plants. So um, some of you talked about this in your talks last term. Boron uh, and graphite are two of the things that they're rods that are placed in there. And that's what the picture is trying to show uh, that absorbs the neutrons. And so the reaction goes, this creates energy beyond our dreams. In fact, I have a book and it shows Eisenhower after World War II in Idaho, you can actually go there, uh, clipping the ribbon for the first nuclear power plant, saying within a decade, all energy would be free for all people on the planet because we found the ultimate source of it. 
Um, but of course that can happen for other reasons. Um, but it is something like if you start with, in my notes I have, if you have one gram of uranium, uh, it is the same as having 150,000 kilograms of coal. So that's like six tons of coal. And coal uh, makes CO2, so the whole global warming thing. So this is considered, believe it or not, a green energy because it doesn't cause global warming, it doesn't cause acid rain, it doesn't cause all these other issues. The problem is we, we, um, we create, there, there is, the waste products have a super duper long half-life. Um, it's not the crazy amount of waste that people generate like with plastics and stuff, but it is a concern because it is nuclear, it can cause damage to our bodies. Uh, and then it has, they don't contain it very well, and so it has leaked into the ground around the nuclear power places, um, which causes contamination. I have that one molecule of TNT, just this you don't need to know, but uh, one molecule. Nobody picked any explosives, it's kind of nice for their papers. One molecule of TNT is 30 electron volts. And one atom of uranium-235 is 200 million electron volts. So a comparison of the potential that is inside these nuclei is unfathomable. And then think about it then what's your potential? Because all of us are made up of atoms. Um, so, right. all right, so that's fission is splitting. I keep going unless you guys have a question. If you do, just speak up. Hopefully. All right, fusion. is the exact opposite, and it's exactly what the word says. You take two small nuclei, and you go larger. So this is what the stars do. Our sun is going through fusion. Um, it's super duper hot, so we've been trying, this is, this is even more energy. Um, and so the equations, the most common equation is there, but everything started out as hydrogen and then becomes helium and then it keeps going. Um, everything below iron goes through, is gonna keep the most stable element on the periodic table is iron 56. Uh, and so that gets into astronomy beyond which I can understand, but it is um, what the stars are all going through nuclear reactions. So if they make a larger element, it then decays to get back down to iron 56. Um, it's a huge amount of energy, but it's a really high temperature, which they've been able to make here on this planet. Um, they can contain the plasma, but they haven't been able to perfectly tap into the electricity to recover it and put it in the grid so we all have it. And then also, um, who's making money would change. Cold fusion was the idea of doing fusion at a normal temperature, and that was done in Salt Lake City. Uh, and these guys were forced to release their data when the Exxon Valdez destroyed the most beautiful harbor up in um, Alaska. And then everybody said their data wasn't yet strong enough. Uh, and the lab in Salt Lake City got bulldozed over and they planted a garden. And I know that because this all happened in the 80s and then in the 90s, I lived in Salt Lake City and one of the first things I did when I was there at the university for two years was I went to find the lab because I wanted to see where the cold fusion lab was and I could not find it. And I finally went and asked the secretaries because the secretaries always know and they told me had been bulldozed over and it was now the gardens and they were gorgeous gardens and I would go for walks there all the time but um, 
Salt Lake, University of Salt Lake, uh, University of Utah didn't want any memory of it. The, the two gentlemen actually work in um, very lovely careers in Europe, um, working with cold fusion. And somebody last term talked about, I think it was Aaron, was it Aaron or Isaac talked about it a little bit with their presentation. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Um, so the next page shows Glenn Seaborg. Very young Glenn Seaboard. You tell that's from the 50s or 40s because it's like awesome equipment. Uh, it's just a short summary of the units. I'm not going to spend time going into it just because time is so precious these days. Uh, Half life. Oh, just a, a comment that I have made. The units, don't worry about them. Disintegrations. Um, there's a unit of Curie. We're going to look at a half life problem just real briefly, but we've already done these but this is good review for your midterm so half-life is again the time for half of the sample to disappear so for half to decay and then the next half-life you'll be at a quarter and the next one one half um, so we can do like the right, the formulas natural log of one half equals negative k t one half, and then um, natural log a final over a initial equals negative k times whatever time you're trying to find. Um, and this one I wanted to mention because uh, Aaron, somebody else had asked me a question. So this one gave us the amount of carbon 14, and it said it's 12.4 D per S. And students will always say to me, what the heck does that unit mean, or curies or millicuries? It doesn't really matter. These two just have to be the same unit, because this is a ratio. Final is always less than initial. Without doing any of the calculations, you know the answer, because we have not made it through a half-life. So that question I keep asking, does your answer make sense? This one's gonna make sense because it's gonna be less than a half-life. Um, and so we would plug in, you would first, step one, you would plug in natural log of one half, right? Equals negative K. I'm gonna go pretty fast here because I wanna get to the last page. Um, so 57, 30 years. We solve for K, we plug that K in. And then we solve for time, and our time comes out as 3,740 years. And then I would ask you, does your answer make sense? And you would say yes, because it has not yet gone through a half-life. It would be at like, what, 9.75 if it had gone through a half-life. So, so your answer doesn't make sense. Yes, it should be less than one half-life. Um, the ones in the homework were more than a half-life. And example two, if you want, you can try, again, for percent, you would just assume the original percent is 100%. Um, and it says, what percent has decomposed? So you would just solve for AT, and you should get around 85%. Um, I'm going to move on unless you guys have questions. Half-Life, we just did with kinetics, so I know you know that. And we got one more page. And we are going to do this math, because this is the coolest math we do all year. All right, and that is because we're gonna get to use one of the most famous equations. Uh, at the top of the page, the mythical island of stability, this was Glenn Seaborg. Um, there are certain elements that are, the nuclei are stable. So I did not realize this. You can Google it and it just blew my mind. Um, CERN has an awesome website and they simplified stuff, so really like, childish brains like me could understand it, but the nucleus is organized. So I had always imagined that all these protons and neutrons are just jammed in there. So, you know, like when we're talking about, say, lead 82, wait, lead's 82, 208. So there's 82 protons in there, and then we would subtract and get, what, 126 neutrons. And I always imagined, oh, they're all crammed in the nucleus. No, there's an organization. There's like these little orbitals in there also. And there are certain, just like the noble gases, 
there are certain nuclei that are stable. So I know tin is one of them. There, one of the tins, I think it's tin 120. I think calcium is one of them. And then element 126 is gonna be one of them. They've made element 126, but they have not gotten the right number of neutrons. So it's a specific neutron and proton. And Glenn Seaborg says when we hit that, we're gonna have a really stable element again. So there's like five isotopes up there that are like extremely stable. Anyway, so there's a magic number and you can Google it and, and look into it. And after, after you get done with all of your stuff going on. So the last thing we're gonna do is binding energy. And binding energy is that energy to hold the protons and neutrons. This is my really simplified way of explaining it, but holds the protons and neutrons in the nucleus, right? So it's kind of like the blue. Um, the thing that's interesting is there's something called a mass defect that, and we're going to do the math here, that when you add up the protons plus the neutrons, their masses never equal the mass of the atom. And that discrepancy is called the mass defect. And that discrepancy is where this very famous equation that every single one of you knows came from. Um, so E equals MC squared. And we're gonna get to use that now, and that's really awesome. And so like your last assignment as a turn, the very last question, you get to do equals MC squared. Um, so there is a note there, we're gonna use joules is the unit for energy. And a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. When you take physics, a lot of you will take physics next year, that becomes second nature. But our mass is gonna to have to be in kilograms. That's gonna be this discrepancy. So we're gonna subtract. That's gonna give us our mass. And then the speed of light, some of you might remember from last term, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and then you square it. So we're gonna figure out the mass first for this problem, and then we'll plug in there. And like, what cooler way could there be to end the term than to get to do equals mc squared? Now you can say, I can use Einstein's famous equation. Um, so for our question, it says you have nitrogen 14. And this is really fun, because we get to use um, this crazy number of significant digits. So this is this funky U, that's an AMU, an atomic mass unit. So you just go with it. Um, so that's the mass of the whole of the atom. What we have to figure out is nitrogen 14 is made up of seven protons and seven neutrons. So we're gonna figure out the mass of those. And if you look on your page, I gave you the mass of a proton is not actually one, it's 1.00. 783. And the mass of the neutron, 1.00867. So apparently people get their PhDs in like physics just to add another uh, digit onto the mass of a proton or a neutron. And there's actually this guy who said they had the mass of the proton wrong. He did it all theoretically and it turned out he's right. I don't know what the mistake was. Um, I've listened to his YouTube and I don't understand that part. He's also very into um, meditation. And so that's actually how I got turned on to him. Um, and so I listened to a lot of his talks on that. Um, and he actually, in his lab, they, he's probably gonna get a Nobel Prize for physics. Um, but anyway, in his lab, they also make crystals. And um, these crystals, they cut them in this very specific way. Um, which is fascinating. 
All right, so you do the math, you add these up, we add this all together, and I've done this enough years that I know this number comes out to 14.1155 AMUs, somewhere, I don't know why I have it written like that, and then we subtract The mass of the whole is not the same as the mass of the parts. The mass of the parts is greater than the mass of the whole. How can that be? And that's the mass defect. So when you subtract that, you're going to get, by the way, an AMU is grams per mole. So when we subtract, we find our change in mass. I'm going to go over to here. The change in mass is 0.11243 grams. Again, you can do this later. I have the numbers from many years and I checked it again today. Um, we do have to change that to kilograms. And then you'll multiply by C squared, this number squared. And that will give us E in joules. I then change it to kilojoules. Um, so I divide by another thousand to change my joules to kilojoules. And so, and then there's one more step. Because the question says per nucleon. So, because we're chemists. So we like to add this extra step. So we would divide by the 14 nucleons. So it's actually a nice way to end this lecture because it's, I think, the first term I talked about on the very first page. A nucleon is your protons plus neutrons. So it was our mass number. So we divide by 14. So the answer comes out 7.5. E to the eighth kilojoules per mole of nucleon. And I guess what I want to point out with this is back to like the little bit I talked about fission and fusion. This number is crazy huge. When we did the math back in Chem 221, and even earlier this term when we did stuff with liquids, and delta H's, we would get like a hundred, if we got a thousand kilojoules, we were like, whoa, that's a big number. Um, this is a hundred million kilojoules, not a hundred kilojoules. So this is a million fold more in, in the atom that is being stored. So every atom in your body is the greatest potential that there is. And then if you go inside the atom and you go inside the protons and neutrons, they're made up of what? Electrons and leptons. And then they go inside of that and there's nothing. It's vibrations. And those vibrations are your thoughts, your emotions, your potential. And so you have the potential to be anything. And so, right. All right. Is there questions? I guess that's my last words for you guys. No way has questions? I'm going to stop my recording. So thank you. I will see you all. Yeah. And, and reminder, so this homework and study set is due next Tuesday, which would be the 9th. I'm going to have office hours from 4 to 6 on that day. It's the same Zoom link. And then I will stay on for the people doing class presentations on Tuesday. Um, half of you have class presentations then on Thursday. And all of you, your paper is due by Friday uh, the 12th. If you have your paper done earlier, that would be lovely. But I will probably be so busy with class presentations. All right, so there's no questions.